Welcome to Maja Wand of Culinary Chemistry at Siena Heights University. My name is Dr. Julius Nagy, and this is my course, and I will be your guide through this first PowerPoint session about water. I want you to know that there is a lot of information about water available on the Module 1 part of our Canvas site. And feel free, and in fact some of that information is going to be part of your assigned readings and watchings. But I also want you to make sure that any questions you have are addressed in one of several ways. You may go out to the dis discussion group that's out there and ask your question or try to answer somebody else's question. And you certainly can get a hold of me through the virtual office uh, tab on the Canvas site or directly by email. Um, whatever you do, make sure you get your questions answered. So let's move on to begin our discussion of water. Water is the most abundant compound on Earth. There are five oceans all over the Earth, and clearly they hold a lot of water. The only thing close probably to the amount of water on Earth is crude oil. Water is the major component of nearly all the food we eat and of us. Although to look at us, we don't look very fluid, we don't look like water, but water is definitely important to human beings. The other thing that's uh, interesting about water is it's what makes microwave ovens work. The energy in the microwave oven is tuned to be absorbed by water molecules. When water molecules vibrate as they absorb that energy, they become hotter. And the other thing that happens is the water molecules, since they're right up against one another, can actually uh, create some friction and create some additional heat. And yes, it's the same kind of friction that you can generate with your hands when you rub your hands together on a cold day. Friction is a tremendous source of heat and energy. So the first topic we want to really delve into in a lot of detail is polarity, that water is a polar molecule, which you may have heard in one form or another. But we're going to try to explain it in a way that's a little bit more easy to understand. I want you to think of those magnets that maybe you once played with uh, as a child. And many of those magnets are marked with a north and a south pole. Well, polarity in chemical um, substances and molecules is exactly the same concept, except we don't use north and south as in the north and south poles of the Earth. We use positive and negative because they are charges. And just like the north and south poles, the north and south poles are opposite, so they're attracted. A positive charge and a minus charge are attracted, whereas two positives or two negatives are going to repel one another. So water molecules have polarity, and this polarity comes about from a concept known as electronegativity that was studied and explained by Linus Pauling, one of the few two-time Nobel Prize winners that have lived on Earth. Electronegativity is basically a need or a desire for electrons. And just quite simply, without going into this whole topic uh, in a lot of detail, oxygen atoms are more electronegative than hydrogen atoms. And all that means is that they want to have the electrons that are between them a little bit more of the time than the hydrogen atom does. And I've got a series of slides to show that in some detail. You can also think of it as they're hogging the electrons in the bond that's holding the O and the H in water together. And this is a lot like what an older sibling would do to a younger, younger sibling. They might be sharing something, but usually it seems like the older sibling has it a little bit more than half the time. That's the idea that we're after. So this then is the arrangement of water molecules in a real molecule of water. Why does it have this particular shape? Well, that's beyond the scope of this course, but be sure that water is not a linear molecule of three uh, atoms right next to one another. It does have this shape, which scientists describe as bent. All the other things don't matter. Well, if we have atoms, we have to have bonds to keep them together. So scientists will represent bonds by this type of dash. And as chemists learn to do these structures, we learn that a dash is the equivalent of two electrons. And because we're going to talk about the electrons, 
let's show you those bonds in the more obvious or the more real format where there are two electrons between each oxygen and hydrogen. And as you see at the bottom, th this is the geography of a covalent bond where the electrons are shared. They're equidistant from the hydrogen and from the oxygen. Now recall the electrons have a negative charge. And if a water molecule had the electrons balanced in this way, actually, it wouldn't be polar. But because of that electronegativity that we talked about, oxygen wants to have the molecules, more the electrons actually, more than 50% of the time. So the effect of electronegativity has me put the electrons in this fashion, where they are both closer to the oxygen further away from the hydrogen, but please realize this is only, this doesn't happen 100% of the time. The electrons do go near the hydrogen atom, it's just a lot less than half the time. All right, so the electrons are still shared, much like you would share something with a friend, but it's not always a 50-50 sharing of things we share with friends or siblings. Sometimes the sharing kind of flips back and forth. Here, the sharing is always going to be where the oxygen has the electrons more than 50% of the time. Because the oxygen has the electron more than 50% of the time, we can go to this slide, where since the oxygen does have the electrons more than 50% of the time, as we say at the top of the screen, this little symbol here is a lowercase Greek letter delta. And for a scientist, it means a little bit. So this symbol says that the oxygen is a little bit negative, And so a water molecule can be electronically neutral. Then the hydrogen atoms, as denoted by this symbol, are a little bit positive. This is where the polarity of a water molecule comes from. It's the separation of charge that is always in place. Now, why is this important? Well, it leads to another important concept called hydrogen bonding. And because all water molecules have the oxygen end partially negative and the hydrogen ends partially positive, they form a network. Now, this network is not bonding. It is not a bonding situation. What it is, is an electrostatic network. And all electrostatic means is positive and negative things associate with one another. You'll notice that I also have the word dynamic in here and that it is always changing. This can be a difficult concept to explain, so let's try, let's try a couple of pictures. Here I have oriented about 10 to 12 H2O molecules so that the negative oxygen sides are associated with a positive hydrogen side of a neighbor. So you can see as we go through this network, these water molecules are all connected to one another in some way. And this happens no matter how many water molecules there are. Because it turns out in a drop of water, there are about 300 billion trillion water molecules just in a drop of water. It's a tremendous number. So we said we we're going to talk about a dynamic network. Well, what's a dynamic network? Well, if I could take a picture of the network, the first picture would be maybe what you see on the screen. And then the next instant, I would get this picture where everything is still connected, but it's connected in a different way. And this goes on continuously. And this is a word dynamic that scientists use to talk about a fluid, ever-changing situation but it's always going to be water. So to summarize, the hydrogen bonding network really is kind of a misnomer that it's not bonding. They're not sharing electrons in this setup. And in this setup, it's a purely electrostatic attraction with no sharing of electrons and that the partners continuously change. And if it helps you to understand the partners changing or dynamic, Think of a square dance where everybody is enjoying themselves, everybody is dancing, and the caller will say, change your partner, switch your partner. If you have ever seen a square dance, 
you know that the partners change pretty much continuously. And that's the kind of dance that's going on among water molecules in a drop or a glass of water. So moving on from that network, next thing we wanted to talk about is how hydrogen um, bonding enables the certain molecules to dissolve in water. And you may have heard somewhere along the course of your life the phrase, like dissolves like. And you should understand what that means a little bit better when we get through these next few slides. So you have already learned in this presentation that water is said to be polar because of the slight separation of charge between the oxygen being slightly negative and the hydrogens being slightly positive. It turns out that several important molecules, and I've listed three of them here, sugar, alcohols, primarily ethanol, and ethylene glycol, which is the thing that makes antifreeze not freeze, all of these molecules are also polar. And because they are polar, they can intersperse themselves into the hydrogen bonding network of the water, and they are very soluble. And the reason that they happen to be polar, I've picked these three, because they all have an OH group like the OH groups in water. And that is the thing that makes them polar. The other thing that you know that water can, uh, that can dissolve in water is salt. And table salt is sodium chloride. So when sodium chloride goes into water, it dissociates into sodium ions and chloride ions. These ions then get surrounded by water molecules that are oriented just the way they are in a hydrogen bonding network, that the negative oxygen part would be oriented toward this positive sodium ion, and the positive hydrogen sides would be oriented toward the negative chloride ion. So these ions would have a cage, really, of water molecules around them, and that keeps them soluble. There are many, many other salts in the world, and they all work the same way as far as uh, being able to be dissolved in water. The other thing that you know doesn't dissolve in water are things like oils. If I pour canola oil onto some water, the canola oil is going to sit on top of the water, and no matter how much I shake it, it's always going to separate into two layers. The consumer product that's the best example of this is Italian salad dressing that needs to be shaken up before it is poured on the salad so that you can get all the flavors from the water phase and all the flavors that are in the oily phase. Next, I want to talk about some of the interesting things that happen when water freezes. It turns out that some of you have some experience with the pipes in your house freezing and then the pipes leaking as the water begins to thaw. Because it turns out that water expands about 9% upon freezing. Now, why does it do this? Well, it's largely the hydrogen bonding. As water freezes, it creates a 3D structure, and you get about 15% more hydrogen bonding when the water molecules move away from one another so that they have the correct spacing when they're in the solid phase. Because they move away from one another and create more open spaces, this is why the density decreases, and this is why ice floats. Now, it's nice that ice floats in the middle of summer when your ice-cold iced tea has ice right at the top where you're drinking out of the top of it because that's the coldest part. But I want you to think for a minute, what would happen if ice sank? So just Think about the world you live in and maybe some of the things you do in the great outdoors. What would happen if ice sunk? Well, I'm thinking of rivers and streams, and it wouldn't be a good situation. But let's start with things like oceans or even the Great Lakes. They have so much water in them that unless there was a very cold snap for a very long time, it's unlikely that they would freeze over. But rivers and streams, with not a lot of water and not a lot of depth, would probably freeze solid. So rather than needing to be sure that there were four to six inches of ice before you could drive your truck onto this body of water, you wouldn't need to worry about that because it would be frozen solid from the bottom all the way to the top. 
Now that's kind of cool if you want to drive your car on uh, on a lake or you want to skate on a lake or play hockey, but if you were a fish, this would not be a good thing because you would be in a frozen solid block of ice. You would not have access to any of the oxygen that's dissolved in water that keeps you alive. And you certainly wouldn't have access to any food because you would be frozen in a block of ice. So nature's food chain would look really different when it came to aquatic species. Another transition here is we need to talk a little bit about the acidity of water because of what I want to talk about on the next slide. But many of you, again, know that pure water has pH 7, but you might not know why. And again, beyond the scope of our course, but just know that when water is neutral at pH 7, the number of protons, or the H plus part of the water molecule, equals the number of particles of OH minus, which is the other part of the water molecules. So everything is in balance at pH 7. If I have a material that is acidic, all I have is I have more of these H plus groups, which are the acidic groups in water, and I have more of them than hydroxide ions, the OH minus ions. Conversely, for a base, it's the exact opposite. I have more of the hydroxide ions than I do of the H plus ions in water. I wanted to get to that because I wanted to talk a little bit about the global warming crisis and where the scientific data says fossil fuel consumption is a big part of it. Now, you may know that when we burn fossil fuels like C8H18, which happens to be octane, and we burn it in oxygen, we produce a lot of carbon dioxide and we actually produce a lot of water. But notice the ratio here. For every molecule of octane that gets consumed by combustion, we produce eight molecules of CO2. And this ratio is clearly not to our advantage. The other thing that happens is when CO2 is in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide can actually dissolve in water and it forms this species, H2CO3, which is known as carbonic acid. You actually have probably consumed gallons upon gallons of carbonic acid because it's the acid that's in carbonated beverages. When CO2 is added to a beverage mixture, it carbonates it. And that very first taste that you get when you pour a pop in your mouth or your tongue, it's almost sharp. It almost hurts with certain pops. It's so sharp. That's carbonic acid. And if you would open up that carbonated beverage and leave it overnight without the cap on, you come back the next day, it's much sweeter, and we say that it's flat because it has no bubbles, right? Well, the bubbles are because the CO2 is gone, and it's much sweeter because that acidity, that bite into your tongue is gone because the carbonic acid left when the CO2 left. Well, when this carbonic acid forms in water, it raises the acidity, which lowers the pH of a body of water. Well, when this first started 40 to 50 years ago, it wasn't a big deal. But as we've continued to burn fossil fuels and we have more and more and more people in the world, we are now at the point where we're disturbing the aquatic balance. We have barrier reefs that are bleaching out. They're not colorful and pretty. They are white. We have shellfish that are being harvested with very thin shells, all because the pH of our oceans are being disturbed in a negative way. Finally, we human beings are about 60% water, and we get out of kilter very easily. If that number drops by a percent or two, we get dehydrated and we get all of the um, effects of being dehydrated all the way to the point of passing out and possibly dying. So that 60% is critically important to us. Just for reference, I've also added that raw meat is about 75% water and fruits and vegetables are 90% water. And those percentages go down slightly when we cook them by like frying or over a fire of some kind. If we braise them by putting them in boiling water or simmering water, the ratio doesn't change as a whole lot. The other thing you need to know is water rights is one of the things that's going to be an ongoing issue for the future. Sure, we can buy water in bottles, no problem. 
but the people who put that water in those bottles are getting their water practically free and they're getting them from places like Great Lakes aquifers all over our region of the country. Um, I think Nestle pays about $200 to get all the water that they get from one of the aquifers here in Michigan. So they are clearly making a massive profit selling Michiganders Michigan water. This is the end of our PowerPoint module on water. Again, a lot of information out on the Canvas page. And please, if you have any questions, don't feel free to contact me either through email or through the virtual office or put your questions out there in the discussion group and let your peers and I in the class help you figure out your answers. Thank you for listening and watching and we'll see you in module two.